Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today, I am joined by entrepreneur, fashion designer, and America's favorite bridal expert on TLC's Say Yes to the Dress, Cheval. Cheval's advanced and diverse experience in the bridal industry made her one of the most sought after luxury bridal designers in the world, earning her opportunities to dress female icons such as Carrie Underwood, Chrissy Teigen, and Dove Cameron. After a decade of working her way up in the industry, Cheval found herself in the legal hot seat after being sued by her employee to gain control of what she believed was her own brand and social media accounts, forcing her to give up much of the hard work she had put in throughout her career. She made the ultimate boss pivot and decided to utilize her entrepreneurial skills to create her own brand under the name Cheval, a powerhouse advocate for artists and creatives. Today, we are going to learn all about the blessing and the curse of contracts, what it's like to be in a legal battle with your employer, and how entrepreneurial spirit helped her rise to the top once again in the fashion industry. Cheval, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I got to say, I've always known you as your former name, which I think freedom of speech, I can say it, right? Haley Page, you don't even have to acknowledge it. (laughs) So even saying Cheval, it's like foreign to me. But let me ask you this, professionally, personally, is it Cheval across the board now? I'm pretty committed to it. And of course, my closest friends and family have a really hard time with it, even Mm. though they like the name. Um, You know, it's just by habit and people tie you to your name. You know, it's not something you really think about. Uh, Of course, when I run into people sometimes at like the airport, it's so funny because they're they mouth it. They're like, are you? And then they say, (laughs) you know, because they're like almost afraid. I can (laughs) say it. Haley Page. (laughs) Uh, So naughty. Yeah. But um, I can't give permission for people to use it, um, obviously. And then I cannot use it in any business or commerce or even to publicly identify because there is this new, you know, overview of social media and how most of social media is in promotion of something. So it's like a taboo area. It's the ultimate predicament. It's one of the reasons I had, when I created Trading Secrets, I always had you on my radar because I'm like, there's so much from your story, entrepreneurial wise and learning lessons of what you're going through that anyone can learn from today that could help them tomorrow. Um, Your birth certificate. Yes. I know you can't say certain things. (laughs) But I can say whatever the hell I want. You're not, you told me not to. So I'm breaking your rules. Is Haley Page, what name is on your birth certificate? Oh, that's, that that's first the name, one? the OG. That one I just yeah. said. <laughs> yeah. Is there ever a potential of changing the birth certificate? Um, You know, I'm open to anything. Okay. I feel like this whole process has really made me focus on putting one step in front of the other, pun intended. But, <laughs> you know, I just want to move forward with my life. Yeah. And however I can do that while still creating and utilizing some of the skill set that I've dedicated my life to, you know, I think that's where the focus goes for me and all my energy. So, Well, you have moved forward. We're going to talk about all how you have moved forward and how you guys can help support Cheval. Before we do that, I'm doing all this research on you, Cheval. It's going to take me so much, so much work though. (laughs) I just, I'm going to keep saying Cheval, 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 because I look at you and I just want to say it the other day, but Cheval, Cheval, Cheval. The first thing I see is a a former bridal dress designer. And even as a friend of yours, like that, it, it hurts me to read that for former bridal dress designer doesn't click. When you hear those words, what are you thinking? I kind of go to a place of, oh, it's a new chapter. Okay. Um, But I will say in everything that I've gone through from the name usage to losing what I always thought were my personal social media accounts, which involved relationships, to basically being withheld from practicing my trade set, you know, and this is something I spent my whole life dedicated to and my industry experience and my education that was where my sense of self struggled the most mm-hmm. because I didn't realize how much I identified as a wedding dress designer. Like it was it was so much of my purpose and it, I felt like it was my gift. And for how self-conscious you can be in life, that was one thing I felt pretty good about and that like, I'm really good at this. Yeah. And that's hard to admit to yourself, especially if you're, you know, you're an artist because, or you're a creator, you, you need the validation, you need other people to tell you that you're good at it a lot, yeah. but I felt it internally. So that was the hardest of the three to overcome. And that's where I actually experienced the most grief because it was sad, you yeah. know? Like, when, do you think a lot of people talk about like in America, we have such working issues, right? Like our lives, our jobs, we are married to our lives. 
being someone who had such an incredible identity tied to your name and your profession, do you have a different take now on, in general, how and if people should live their identity through their job? Are there tips you'd give someone who feels like their identity is their job? Are you for it, against it? What's your take on that? When I really think about it, I I take the approach that if anything had been different, it might have not been as authentic. So I obviously went all in. I mean, I was like, I'm going for it, you know, and I'm going to prove myself and I'm going to do this excellent job and I'm going to become invaluable to my former employer. You know, that's kind of the, the mindset I had. And I also didn't want to lose my opportunity. Um, And that was one of the reasons I felt pressured to sign, you know, as is without a lawyer, you know, all that stuff. And I don't know. It's it's hard because so much of my creative expression comes from who I am. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to flow without double thinking yourself, you know, or like um, putting those those boundaries up. But at the same token, now that I've experienced it, I've realized I really do need to have better boundaries and I need to learn how to protect myself while also holding on to that authenticity. Mm -hmm. And that's a struggle. So, I mean, I wouldn't say no, but at the same time, it's like, let's take a beat, you know, and try to respond as opposed to react to things. Yeah. Um, So that's like the best way I can answer that. It's just, it's tough because identity wise, It comes from many forms, but I think until it's actually challenged, you don't really know it. Totally. Totally. I think that makes perfect sense. And and we're going to get into how it was challenged, when it was challenged, and all the specifics. But one take I realized after I left the banking world is that my identity was just, I was my title, vice president, senior corporate banker. That's what I was. In conversations, it was the first thing I would ask someone, what do you do? It's the first thing I'm asked. Now I really try and take a different approach. If someone wants to start the conversation with me by saying, what do you do? Like right from the get-go, I'm going to like make up something or I'm going to say, I don't know. I'm going to detour the conversation because I think we've gotten in this weird routine of like instantly benchmarking someone's either their success, their socioeconomic status, their intelligence, all that from some bullshit type or like place at which they work now. And they might have 15 other side jobs. It just doesn't tell the story. So I try to avoid that now thinking about what I know then. Do you ever try to avoid like things like that or? I think that's really refreshing. Yeah. Um, And it's kind of hard to do because almost by default, Mm -hmm. that's the first thing you go to. Like, well, what do you do most of the day? You know, and and usually it's your job. Yeah. Um, But I guess when I ask people questions, a lot of times it's, achievement focused. Like Mm -hmm. you said, it's benchmarking. Um, And I think growing up, I was a competitive gymnast and I was really into my schoolwork, you know, so I was always going for the stars, you know, and like the minute you got the star, you're on to the next star, you know, and that's just kind of how you you operate. But then so much of your life becomes very mechanical and you're not really mindful and living in the moments. Um, And it's not like everybody needs to experience a trauma, but I think going through something like I did – you know, um, it made me stop and think for for Mm -hmm. a bit and like, okay, well, what am I going to do with my life? You know? And I kind of relate it to actually professional athletes when they no longer are doing what they've done their whole life. Right. And then like, who are they after the Olympics? Who are they after, you know, they're not doing gymnastics anymore. And those big page turners, you know, it's, it's tough because it's almost like you're closing the book. You're not just turning the page, you know, it's like you're, you're starting a new book, you know? So yeah, I really appreciate that. I don't know. So if I was to ask you, what do you do? Would you say like, I I sometimes say like, if someone's like, what do you do? I go, I don't know. Sometimes they'll be like, I don't know. And I'll be like, I do a bunch of things, but you know, let's, we'll go get into that. Like I try and like (laughs) deflect the conversation yeah, because I don't want that to take up the majority of how I get to know someone first and then my impressions built. So I'll like say something like goofy or something like that. Like I Sunday fun day, like I Sunday fun day. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just, it depends on what the moment is. Like I was at, there's a social club at Longo and this guy's like in his suit and tie and he runs this big real estate firm. He's like, sir, what do you do? I was like, ah, I'm, pretty much unemployed. I don't do much. And just like the look, I just said it for fun. The look of disgust he had, because I was in like a backwards hat and sweats and like didn't care. It was like, and I was like, see, that's the social experiment there. You have no idea what I do. And now you're instantly judging me. But um, I think that's a good segue to always chasing the next step, always chasing the next title. That's something you were doing and you were doing it super fast. And then 
What actually put you in this contractual predicament was when you were offered the job as a major head of design, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So before we get into the contract, being offered head of design, like what does that mean in this industry and how big of a job is that? It's a big job. And it's, I would say if you want to be a designer, you know, getting to be the head of a collection and um, harness everything with the creative vision, it's, it's the big dream, you know? Okay. So when I was offered that, I just felt like I've got to grab this opportunity, you know? And it was something I had want my whole life. Um, so I didn't want to compromise anything. Yeah. I just, and I wanted to get started so fast, you know? Yeah. So it, um, it's interesting when you look at all these different industries and like what's the top, you know? Um, the pinnacle of that. Yeah, the pinnacle. It, a head designer for me is that maybe creative director mm -hmm. could also be, but okay. but I was offered a head designer position and it was an employment contract. It was not, you know, right on the contract, it's employment, you know? Okay. So it's not like it was a partnership or there was any kind of, Got it. you know- Anything beyond that. So you're so. you're a W two when you get you're a W two. Oh, yeah. It's almost like being an executive. Like if you look at most people that are head of design and you look at their resume, how many years experience they typically have before they get a role like that? Ooh, I would say seven to ten years okay. of experience typically. How many did you have? Um, well, so I did five years before that industry okay. wise. Uh, I worked at a company called Priscilla of Boston, which I mean, if you're a bridal buff, you definitely remember yeah. that. Um, and then I had a, a short bout working for a licensing brand with Marquesa, okay. which was spectacular. Um, so I felt like I really came to the table with a lot of industry experience. I had already done overseas tech packs. I understood how to work in a sample room. I brought my head pattern maker with me, you know, so that there was definitely a lot that I felt like I could present and put myself up there as like, please consider me for this, okay. you know? Yeah. Um, Okay. There's the answer. There you go. Head of yeah. design. So we're going to get into contract terms. I'm going to keep, keep teasing that. But before we do that, head of design, most places, what does compensation structure look like? Um, You know, it, it ranges because it depends on the size of the company and the distribution. And like if I was to ballpark it, I would say a head designer anywhere from like 150 to 250 maybe. Okay. Or a hundred to two fifty, uh, but if you have, if you're like more of a staff designer, yeah. in the sense of you're leading the design team, but you're in a position where you're living out somebody else's vision, right? So it's like somebody else's brand. Mm -hmm. I think those salaries can be, you know, from sixty to a hundred, right? Um, and sometimes there's like a percentage of sales involved that you get, you know, if you're either a sales director or you're a um, designer. But um, you know, I mean, that's pretty much the composition. You get a salary, okay. and then you know, there, there's an incentive to. So <laughs> how many? Yeah, of course. But how many people that are head of design also have the signature line under their name? Is that pretty normal, or is that an outlier? No, I think it's um, it's definitely a goal for all okay. designers, and and this not all designers, I shouldn't say yeah. that, but it's for a lot of people the idea that you. It's your name and it's your vision, um, especially I think in the bridal industry because it's not like you get these big heritage brands typically mm -hmm. in bridal. Mm -hmm. It's not like Chanel, you know, yeah. or Balmain, like all these brands where, you know, they bring in new designers and freshen up with creative directors and all that stuff because it's been around and, right. you know, the original designer is no longer there, <laughs> sure. you know, for for other reasons and why I'm not there. But you know, it's it's just a different animal. Um, and I think with with bridal, there's such an emotional attachment and it's a different purchasing process. Okay. So I think when the name is behind it, it makes it a lot more special. It makes it more um, from a place of uh, just like love and sentiment. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it depends. But okay. I would say actually coming from Priscilla Boston, I mean, I knew some of the salaries went up to, you know, almost seven figures. Okay. You know, so that, that can happen. Because that's it what I'm, tr I'm trying to back into, right? So if you're yeah. 150 to 250 at head of design, but then they're using potentially your name to create a signature line. Is it possibly comparable to, let's say, I'm going to say Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan works for Chicago Bulls. Chicago Bulls pay him a really good salary. But every day Michael Jordan was playing, he was building that personal brand. 
And that personal brand became much, 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 much more valuable than the contract that he had as an employee for right. the Chicago Bulls. Right. Is that similar that when you're building equity within this line in your name, the value of that individual in the industry becomes much greater than the potential 150 to 250K salary of the job? I think that is an amazing um, paradox to look at because – while I would have loved that to be my situation, what I came to find was that everything that I could have done outside of my contract didn't seem like it was free to me. Um, you know, like I wasn't able to pursue those things. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the contract that I never fully understood, you know, especially because in my mind, I'm working for a bridal house, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a specific role that I'm doing. Right. So anything outside of that, you know, I kind of always assumed, well, I should be able to do. Um, and, you know, back in 2020 when the pandemic hit, you know, I think everyone kind of looked at other streams of yeah, revenue. Had to. You know, had and to. obviously growing what I thought was my personal Instagram to over a million followers and having this amazing audience where, you know, at the time I was getting tons of messages of like, what is your workout like? You know, sure. what do you eat on the regular? Like all Makeup these things. Do you wear? That, yeah, all the things outside all of that, that stuff. industry. And it just felt like, you know, this is an area where I feel like I can reach new people, but I also can answer the questions I'm being asked. Um, and even back then at the time, you know, I actually did go to a lawyer and I asked, you know, I'm going to influence, can I do this? You know, and yeah. I mean, I had I had a very positive experience in wanting to to do that and do it very thoughtfully. Um, but again, this became a huge source of contention in my lawsuit like months, months later. Okay. Um, and, you know, my fiance, Conrad at the time, he was also doing, you know, fitness influencing sure. and brand influencing. And so we were super curious and we wanted to to explore it like anyone in that kind of space. Of course. Um, but when you think about like, you know, Michael Jordan, what I think is interesting is that he is such an outlier because he spoke to a generation mm -hmm. outside of basketball. I mean, obviously basketball really sure, helped with sure. it, yeah. but he really did command himself as like a champion outside of the court. Of and so that allowed for this goodwill and these relationships and these other opportunities. And that's where I feel like the benefit is. So while I felt very restricted once this lawsuit hit and I realized I can't literally do anything outside mm -hmm. of, you know, with my name and all this stuff, sure. I was like, well, bare bones, I still have a sense of goodwill with the people that I've met along the way, um, the real interactions in person, even the stuff on social media that, you know, those people that used to follow me can now follow me somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so the reputation was so important. Interesting. And um, and I'm grateful for that because ultimately, bare bones, that's what I have. I have my reputation still. I have these good relationships with people. And that's something no one is entitled to. Yeah. And that, that's what I was trying to draw from that because that reputation stays with you forever. Even when your name might be stripped from you, that reputation still has a value. And I think you might agree or maybe disagree. You tell me 150K to 250K on an annual basis. Uh, if you look at the like long term of that value, I think your reputation is greater than that because all the businesses you could build today, even with that stuff stripped away, I think is more than what you were paid just being in this title. So I think the importance of repu reputation is just massive. What was the year that you signed that contract? 2011. 2011. Okay. And then when did you, what was the, because most people know you from Say Yes to the Dress. Yes. A lot of people do at least. <laughs> um, what was the year you started with Say Yes to the Dress? I am I try to remember this exact date. I, I would say it was like early 2014 potentially. And then I was married once yep. before, dress rehearsal, um, <laughs> in 2015. Dress and rehearsal. that wedding is, uh, yeah, it's still, you know, rerun on Say Yes. Um, beautiful wedding, but, yep. you know. Didn't work out. Sure. You know, it all happens. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I'd say yes was um totally separate actually from my former employer. Okay. Um so I, I love making that distinction because um, you know, for me that experience was so wonderful and is not tarnished for me, you know. Um and and I I try to make sure people know that. Um, because it was tied to Kleinfeld as well. And I just I love, I'll always love Kleinfeld. <laughs> Today, could you still do say yes to the dress? You know, I don't know that question or the answer to that question. Um, I don't. Okay. I, I don't know. Interesting. Okay. So probably not. Probably not. I mean, maybe if it was, 
I was not using my name. <laughs> but then it would be really weird. <laughs> um, and then it wasn't anything to do with, you know, the dress. wedding dresses. <laughs> so. so you couldn't use your name and you couldn't deal with the dresses. I don't think so. And you sure you couldn't design them. Yeah. Oh, and, definitely not. And no. you still can't design. No. Yeah. No, I'm under a five-year provision in which I can't identify to the trade as a designer in the categories that my ma- my former employer manufactures and sells. Okay. That's the provision. 2011, yes. you sign the contract. You don't really totally understand what you're entering into. 2014, you're on Say Yes to the Dress. What was the year this all came to a head when you learned the reality of what you executed on? So in 2019, the contract was actually coming to an end. And then I actually went into a very large period of negotiating on the contract. So there was a big period of time in which, you know, I really felt like there were things, circumstances that did not exist at the time of signing the contract that needed to be properly, you know, clarified and written in and all this stuff. I mean, there's no mention of social media in my contract, not mm-hmm. one mention of it. And at the time, Instagram was a photo editing app, of you course. know, Valencia, Borders, That's all it. this stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm and I was single in the city. So I was like, late night fun cocktails. Yeah. I mean, there's so much content I took off of Instagram that I now wish I would have kept up. But, um, you know, it was it was just interesting. And I, I remember feeling very um, frightened. And, you know, obviously that's a very uncomfortable thing in a work environment. But I did not have a lot of negotiating skills. Um, you know, I went to a great school. I always felt like I had I had a good skill set and good educational brain. But I'm a people pleaser. And, you know, it's really tough for me to ask for what I want. Mm, and I have the same issues. You do? I learned that in therapy. Ugh, I, Chair, need to I don't go take up a lot often. of space. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I remember we were doing this, uh, not to get too off on a tangent, but storyboarding. You're supposed to put like a square of a memory you had as a child. And you do 20 boxes. You you fill it out throughout a month and then you bring it to the therapist and you go through what these messages mean and they derive like what you've took from it and how it derives to where you are today. Yeah. And so a lot of people come in with like a board this big. They come up with like a big wall. I came in with a little piece of paper <laughs> Here's a and my note. <laughs> boxes were this big. And she starts laughing before I even go. She's like, I mean, I already knew that taking up space was an issue of yours and asking for help and asking for things. This defines it. Like not taking up space. So we we share that together. Yeah, it it can be really tough. And then so we started this negotiation process. I finally, you know, kind of brought in a a legal team Mm -hmm. and it it felt very contentious and very, very um, like the delta was so enormous, which I really had a hard time understanding because um you know, I felt like this was a long time coming. And I I felt like I was working up to this moment to be kind of seen and respected as a businesswoman. And I don't feel like I was seen that way. <laughs> Quick question there. So 2011, you get the head of design. You're now renegotiating in 2019. Yeah, it was a long-term contract. Yeah. But, but are you renegotiating because you just find that it's not with the times or was it only an eight-year contract? No. So like, it was, was yeah, it was a I think it was either a seven or an eight-year contract, and then there was a three-year option, an extension. Okay. Um, so we were negotiating within that window, um, the the extension period. And obviously, I can't speak too much on the actual negotiation side of things sure. during that time, but I was obviously still working at the company. And then COVID hit, um, and I, I felt like the goalpost kind of kept moving. So it was like uh, – it was it was terrifying to be honest. Um, for me, the experience was not good, and then I it kind of came to a head when I was served a lawsuit while I was still working at the company, and it was in a federal court, which meant this had been planned for a long period of time because you can't just be like, okay, I'm going to sue someone, and the next day you have a lawsuit. Like it was built up. What did the lawsuit read? Um, well, it was like hundred. Like it was like a hundred pages. The, the synopsis of it um, was. Yeah, it was basically. Uh, they sued me for the rights to my name, among other things. My social media was included. There was infringement. There's it, it's it was really comprehensive. And you have no idea this is coming. N- not no really. No indication like, hey, this just so you know, we could do this. This I mean, could happen. If I'm being as um, I don't want to be disingenuous. I will say that like I was having moments of physical manifestation. Like I was shaking on the daily. Like I felt very unsafe in my Interesting. very unsettled. You felt it coming. And I kind of felt like, oh my gosh, like, is this going to happen? Like, could this happen? You know? And it, so when it did, it still felt like a, 
you know, a punch to the gut Mm -hmm. in the sense of I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, so like it felt very much like a a tactic, like a um a strategy of some sort. Scare move. Yeah, something like that. And you know, I can't speak for them, but when when that happened, um, it was actually kind of freeing because in that moment and then in the days that followed, because we got granted like an emergency TRO hearing, and this was in COVID. I'm Mm -hmm. like Of all cases, my case is getting granted like this emergency status and like we had really no time to prepare for it. And like, so it was, it was kind of like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? And then in the TRO hearing, literally everything was kind of just granted to the, my former employer. And in that 24 hour period, I had to turn over my passwords. I couldn't use my name. Like all these things happened right away. And I was in Tahoe with my, with Conrad and I, as crazy as it was, I felt free because I knew in that moment that for me morally, I would never be able to do business like that. I would never be able to operate that way. Um, and so I knew that the only decision I could make was resigning. Like I, I physically knew I could not work there. So I resigned like two days later. So they take your, they take your name. They take your social media, they take pretty much your life's work right from your hands. And there's still no part of you that's thinking, maybe I should find a happy medium or negotiate with them. Right. So you like, this is a very common sense approach, right? Right. And because there was this lengthy period of negotiating before that, and it felt increasingly uncomfortable and contentious, this, it almost felt like, okay, this is a long time coming. And that had already been tried, in in my opinion. You know, like, there had been attempts. Okay. So um, I think for me, my constitution, like, I, I do consider myself a very moral, honest person to a fault sometimes because I think in a lawsuit, there is a strategy. There is arguments. There are things that are interpreted way beyond what you can possibly imagine. Of course. And when – there are arguments made that do not reflect my actual experience. I have a very hard time with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, it was like, I, f- I felt like it was dead to me, you know? So like, yeah. there's no coming back from this. And like, yeah. I've been through a divorce, you know, like I know how to cut, cut, you know, yeah. in my <laughs> life, I cut can run. cut, <laughs> I cut and run. So I, so I knew that I was like, okay, I'm, you know, this is it. This is the decision I'm making. And I had conviction with it. So. And so did you sign it in 2011, 2019 or when all these negotiations go through, you served the papers in 2020. 2020, yes. Looking back on it, if you had not negotiated, the contract renews and you get, I don't know, your basic bumps in salary and all the things that you'd imagine, do you think they would have pursued this or do you think this would have come to fruition? Do you think you would have recognized what you had signed off on or would you still be working there? I don't know. Um Because it, in my experience, it got so bad so quickly that it made me feel like the actual tenure there was extremely delicate. And and I didn't really feel that way for a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. Um, But when this happened, I was like, whoa, that unraveled like a bad sweater. You know, so it must have been a bad sweater. You know, that's 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 kind of how I think of it. That's a good point. Um, But I also feel like, you know, when you – when a brand starts to grow and you go to back to the Michael Jordan reference, you know, um, when it feels like somebody is trying to exert uh, a level of control and entitlement over that, I think as a human being, we all take a beat and a moment to just say like, you know – are these the partnerships I want? Or is this the kind of business that I want to conduct? You know? And so you get time to think about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think regardless, there would have been some other opportunities Mm -hmm. that were coming that were outside of what I considered, you know, a head designer position outside of my contract. So it would have had to be discussed at some point, I think. Yeah. Interesting. Everything I hear about this makes me want to like point the finger and scream and yell at this company and be like, what the fuck's wrong with you guys? So I try to like explore curiosities of like where their head could be and what it was. And I, I, there's nothing I can justify. I'm curious though, like was the renegotiation 
just so astronomical that it was like hard to comprehend. Like I'm under trying to understand why they would strip someone's name, why they would strip your identity, why they'd pursue it so hard. And then I go back to again another sports reference. You hear some of these quarterbacks like they hold out because they want a billion dollar contract, right. and you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> come on, don't like, be realistic. Not my were approach. Were you actually. <laughs> holding out? Like I don't know if you could speak to this or not, but were you holding out for like requests that were just completely arbitrary, or were they like standard renewal requests that you wanted? I think because there was a contract that clearly um, felt one-sided, everything kind of comes back to that, you know. And when and people talk about it, they're like, "How can they take take the name? How can you know all this stuff?" And it's like, well, the way that the contract is written and how it can be argued, how it can be interpreted, you know, they, it's not within the four corners. It should be, but it's really not. And so there is a legal right there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think where the real discussion is, is, is it, does that make it right though? Mm -hmm. You know, and like in terms of like the ethics of it and all that stuff, that's where the conversation is. But unfortunately in a court of law, a lot of what is happening, you know, they're in, in the legal right to do that. Um, and I'll never understand the human motivation behind it. I will not. And I've, I've stopped, you know, dwelling on that because I tried to understand it. Um, but I, you know, I'm not a very religious person, but I do have faith. And I just was like, this is, this is God at work for me. And this, there's a reason for this that's mm-hmm. happening. And it is my duty to step forward and take accountability at this point, because I don't want to become a professional victim, yeah, you know? And, totally. and I also don't want this to feel like the adversity Olympics, because yeah. when you go through something <laughs> like this, it's like, you, you, you really like have to go through these exercises and explain it um, to yourself at least. But then when you're having, you know, interviews and all that stuff and people are like, how does this happen? You know, and I don't know if you've seen the meme with the cow and it says, I am cringe, but I am free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's how, my that, life. like literally, that defines your <laughs> yes. entire life. All right. And that's a good segue too. We also will talk about it, but you create a non for profit to help people going through similar battles. Let's just talk a little bit about the battle more. If you had to just guess, you had to put a dollar amount of the value of what your brand was with your name, which I can say was Haley Page. I know you can. But if you took the Instagram and just the value of the brand and everything, what would you value that at before? Like if a professional company came inside, I think the name image likeness of this is around X amount of dollars. What do you think it was? I don't know if I can legally answer this question, but I'm going to just because it's so exciting to me. Yeah. Like what I will say is I actually think the value is zero dollars if I – I'm not the person behind it. That's my opinion. Well, you took my next question. You just stripped my next question. <laughs> I think it is I zero dollars. I was think here's where I was going <laughs> with the question. You just read my book before I even could write it. Um, yeah. My question was going to be like, what do you think it was before the contract? What do you think it is today? And then I'm just trying to justify like, why would they do it? So if you valued it at, let's say it was like valued around $3 million. And then today you can't even associate your name to it. It has to decrease, especially the way you've gotten your message out there in some capacity. I'm like, why would they spend the money on the attorneys, the effort, all that, if the value of the brand is decreasing by the second without you attached to it? Maybe there is a different perspective, you know, that they're coming from. And obviously like, uh, when when you run a company, and now that I do run a co- you know run a company, you you think about things probably a little more um, sales oriented. Mm-hmm. Like, well, we can still sell this product sure. or whatever. Sure. Um, and then there's value in that without p- potentially the person behind it or whatever. Okay. I mean, this is just me totally from my opinion and thinking about it. Um, but I honestly kick myself because while. I was there. I felt like I was never really privy to financial details Mm -hmm. of that nature. And now I am like such a numbers person. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful because I I before was just like, oh, money. You know, like, oh, that's so stupid. (laughs) But like now I'm like, oh my gosh, money. You know, like how do I I survive? Um, And so now I look at it from a different perspective. But I still think with branding and valuations and all that kind of stuff, uh, because there's dilution in every single industry and market now, the secret sauce is the human. It's the human mm-hmm. connection. It's the human behind the brand. And it's becoming more of that every mm-hmm. single day. 
And I think the valuation is only as good as the energy and authenticity and effort of that human. That's so true. Like, I believe that hard, hardcore. And I believe it for, like, influencing. Mm-hmm. I believe it for, you know, of course, athletes. You yeah. know, their heart and soul is in the game. Of course. Um, and I love that because it it becomes this synonymous uh, synonymous energy mm-hmm. um, in which no one else is entitled to your labor, your work, your creativity. And I think that's wonderful for everyone to have their own accountability and ownership of self. Yeah. Well, it's so yeah. true because even if you look at some of the biggest companies in the world that operate um, just automatically based on products that don't align with their leaders, right? You look at Amazon. Uh, You look at uh, Tesla, you look at Apple, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, all these big leaders, they have to have massive key man insurance policies. We'll explain that in the recap. But essentially, if they were to pass or something was to happen to them, the value the company would get would be exorbitant because that one person, even though it's not their brand, even though it's not, you know, tens of thousands of people working for them, they have that much influence. And it goes back to like exactly what you said about your energy. A question I have for you is in most lawsuits, especially like personal injury firms and stuff like this. We'll talk more about this in the recap. They never go to court. They never go to court because they have to be settled. They have to be settled because Mm -hmm. the cost of going to court is way too exorbitant. You decided to fight this. Uh, That had to be pretty expensive. Did you have to hire your own attorneys? Did the company pay for your attorneys? Oh, gosh, What did you – what what was your legal bill? Um, Yeah, I (laughs) – I don't even know where to begin with this, but I <laughs> that love- That was just like an instant <laughs> sign of defeat. I know, I'm like, like, like I'm just my like, name and my energy. Ah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, completely devoid. I literally love my legal team. Um, I was very lucky to get them when I did, and I did not feel like I had a choice but to uh, defend myself. Uh, again, because the experience and the arguments and the things were just not aligning for mm-hmm. me. So when you feel misrepresented, especially in a federal court- there is a certain level of like swallowing that like you just it's so hard to to be the person I am and to be like portrayed this way. Mm-hmm. It's so hard to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Financially, um I it's devastating. It is absolutely devastating. I've spent all the money I ever made in my life, you know, to defend myself, but I am up against a corporation, you know, it's an individual against a corporation and it feels like so much effort and money has gone into basically controlling me kind of, you know, that's how I feel. And like, and suppressing talent too, because, and again, this is my opinion, but it's, it's like when you have an industry where there really isn't trade secrets, Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's designed. It's, you know, it's brain, artistic. Right? It's, it's yeah. your brain. Like <clears throat> there isn't like this thing that really feels like it needs to be protected. And instead, I think it needs to be set free, you yeah. know, because every industry needs the best players on the field. Yeah. And, um, you know, not to say I'm the best wedding dresses I, I was or anything like that, but I feel like it was my gift and I could do a pretty good job at it. Yeah. And the fact that I'm not allowed to do it, I feel like it is the casualty is the industry and the women that wanted an authentic dress, you know? Uh, the tens of thousands of people plus that you've helped and maybe the tens of thousands that would have been helped by you, Yeah, right? And like, it's confusing financially. I mean, as a financial person yeah. that you are, I mean, you look at it and it's like, why is all this money being spent to do this? But then there's a contract, you know, that is set up to protect, but it feels like it's now being weaponized, you know, totally. in a way. And so, again, it comes back to like, I just – have a really hard time understanding it. Yeah. But I'm still in it. I am very much unable to afford my life right now in any way, shape, or form and thank the lucky stars for Conrad because I wouldn't be where I am without him. Wow. And he just like uh, has been my North Star. He's been the one thing that's constant in my wow. life, um, but he has been financially stable. And so for me to have the ability to move forward because of him, mm-hmm. you know, it does make it extra special. I'm yeah. so, like, I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. And a lot of people don't have that, you know, I, well, yeah. I don't know what you would do. I, you just go bankrupt, you know? And yeah. then I, I don't know what happens in a legal case. I, yeah. all these things, you is know, that's something, is that something you've, first of all, Conrad, shout out to you, Conrad. Yeah, he is the best. man, such a good guy. <laughs> You're in his presence. Your energy is lifted. Just electric guy, electric. Um, so shout out to Conrad. Oh. Um, but did you ever think of it like, is that something across your mind? Do you just bankrupt your former name and just refresh everything? Well, in a way, the 
the moving forward and changing my name felt like, you know, I am opening the, the page of a new book, mm-hmm. you know? And, totally. um, but you know, for me, it bankruptcy, if, if that is something it, it's out of necessity, <laughs> like I yeah. don't have a choice. Yeah. Um, and I don't really fully know what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, but I am just hoping that I can defend myself as long as I can, mm-hmm. uh, because I think it's the right thing to do. And while I'm definitely climbing an uphill battle and in the legal world, like, you know, I'm appealing the yeah. non-compete and all like all this stuff. Um, you're only in it as long as your resources last, you know, that's oh, the yeah. truth. Um, so it's, it's, a- can you give me a true or false? I'm project. I'm going to, sure. I'm going to yeah. guess true or false. This has cost you over 150 grand. Oh my gosh. Yes. Well, significantly more. I don't know if I can even say it. I'm going to say it for now. We can edit it later, but yeah. like 10 X that. 10x that. So I can. I feel like I went in Paltro, or like I'm like I feel like I'm like in a, a Johnny Depp. I'm in a trial, or like we're not even in trial we yet. We need but more I feel publicity like- on trial. <laughs> this is got kind of, This is insane. Yeah, it's right, insane. If we, in case insane. we have to edit this out. True or false? I'm going to take a shot. You've spent over seven figures. Yes, or close to on this. True. I have no words. That's just. I mean, that's. Am I wrong to say? This is wiping out majority of your wealth. Uh, yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> I mean, I've had to make um, major decisions in life, you know, in terms of like oh, selling things sure. off, sure. and you know, I mean, it is bare bones here, um, and it's been extremely hard to not be able to work in where I know my talent and skill is, and so having to start a new brand. You know, I've had to invest in educating myself on shoemaking, sure. you know. And so even with that, it, it's been really tricky. And it's also been really hard because when I'm in this situation where it's like, wow, I can't even use my name, like what kind of contracts can I even sign with my name? Right. So like even influencing and doing all this other can stuff. Can you even put your name? Do you have to have an agent put the name on it? Like exa- all the details you, know, you have to oh, think yeah. about. And then and then the legal bills it takes to say, can you read this? Can I sign this? Can I – let me see if this is approved. Let me – let me. you know, it's like you're spending all this extra money too to try to find a way forward. You know, and I've lost out on television hosting gigs. I've lost, uh, lost out on other like illustration and design offers. I mean, I have lost so many opportunities because of my situation. And I think a lot of people too, you know, when you talk about a lawsuit – it's very, it seems very negative, you know, and like, do people want to invite that energy of in, course, you yeah. know? So it's Well, everyone's so been, PR conscious these days. It's like, do they want their host to then right. have, they don't know the predictability of what's next. It yeah. becomes stuff. It makes me disgusting. It makes me want to just like a throw up. It's grotesque. It's just, her, the whole thing is disgusting. Like it's wiped your wealth. They, like you said, it's taken you away from what you know. So even if your wealth is wiped, then how do you go earn what you know? But you have pivoted, which is amazing. We're going to talk about the pivot and how you guys can support support Cheval, but I want to get to quick learning lessons people could take away. Did you have an attorney look over the first contract and knowing what you know now, what would you have done different before you signed the first contract that got you stuck here? I did not have counsel or a lawyer. Okay. Um, uh, hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> so 2020. Yeah, of Definitely would have. Um, but I also have to say this, given the experience and the trauma, I really don't know if it would have mattered in the sense of the only thing that would have probably changed is if I just didn't sign it. Like, I don't feel like I would have had negotiating power even back then, you know, when it's I good, really think really about it. It's a good point. It's kind of like, I don't want to compare it like the yeah. situation of The Bachelor, but it's the same thing. Like, I remember when I gave my attorney the Bachelor contract, he just like laughed at me. He's like, anything in my life I've been taught to negotiate, take the opposite of it. That's the entire contract. But what I said to him is like, well, if I don't sign it, I'm one of a million. Like I'm not going to go. Yes. So you, I would have had to sign. No matter what, you had to sign. It's that's, and that's how you felt. That's devastating, and that's the truth. Is it's if I don't, somebody else will, and I'll lose my opportunity. And so for me, the real um, solution would have been to go with someone else, a different company. Mm-hmm. That would have been what I would have done. Um, there wouldn't have been like, oh, I would have brought in a big old team sure. and got in there and. You know, and I think that too goes back to our nonprofit and what we do want to do is when you are young and you're hungry for those opportunities and there is a chance that you might be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And it's not just ignorance. It is vulnerability. And it's being in a room potentially with somebody that 
assures you of something, you know, or like whatever it may be to, mm-hmm. to kind of get you to sign it or say it's a boilerplate. Everyone signs it. There's all these red flags now. But I think to have advocacy and to have a place to go to say like, you know, what is what are my chances here? Like you're really not just signing a contract. You're also investing in a relationship and mm-hmm. a, a business relationship. And that's something you have to kind of think about is like, do you, have you done your due diligence on the company? You mm-hmm. know, like, I know mm-hmm. you want the job, but let's make sure it's, that's right for you. Yeah. You know, and there are other, there are so many companies out there. Mm-hmm. And while you might think like, oh, this is it, you know, it, it could maybe not be. So mm-hmm. that's what we want to do um, with A Girl You Might Know Foundation is, you know, help young artists and creators and people that are people pleasers that don't want to, you know, be combative and want to be a team player, but it can end up, you know, I'm, I'm so, um, authority driven. Like I really respect authority Mm -hmm. and that can sometimes hurt me if I don't have an opinion, you know, or stand up for myself. So hundred percent. I want to try and take this situation and give the listeners that we call them the money mafia back at home, one piece of advice, because they might not be having a head of design contract, but they might have a contract with a friend to buy into a company. They might have a prenup. They might have uh, an employment contract that's different than yours. What is like one overall piece of advice you'd give someone, whether it's a personal or professional contract, knowing what you know now? I feel like a lawyer, <laughs> you know, like you got to go with a lawyer that that would be the one piece of advice if, if it's just narrowed down to one, um, not be quick to compromise too much of yourself in a contract. And I think too, if somebody is pressuring you with time, mm-hmm. because that can always be a weapon in that we got to get this done because of X, Y, Z or whatever. And, and we don't have time for lawyers, you know, y- you know, and we'll figure it out, you know, all that kind of, that kind of stuff. It is for me now, like that's, that's a big red flag. Yeah. And if anyone ever says like, you know, you don't need a lawyer or whatever, it's like that you got to get a lawyer. You got to take a minute to protect yourself. It's worth the investment. And for those that don't have the money, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully a girl, you foundation can come in and help <laughs> provide pro bono, you know, resources or, or legal counsel that, you know, is more affordable. So people that have a contract, they can't afford an attorney. Uh, they want to connect with a girl you might know foundation, which you started, where do they go? Yeah. So they just go to a girl you might know foundation.org okay. and they can just email us and we will get the conversation moving. And it's, it's all pro bono okay. on our end as well. It's a not-for-profit. So, um, yeah, we just launched on international women's day and, you know, we really want to have, um, a foundation set up Mm -hmm. so that it's resources, it's connecting people to these pro bono or affordable services because so many law firms actually have to do a certain number of pro bono work every year. Yeah. So did not know. That's a trading secret right there. It is. It's amazing. And then you have all of these lawyers and attorneys that literally have been following the case, you know, and that are like, I want to help like, because wow. I've seen this happen or this happen or whatever. Yeah. And so we've had, we've had an amazing Rolodex of people already willing to help that are nuanced too, because it's IP, it's, you know, trade secrets, sure. it's contract law, it's employment law. It's, there's so many things. Um, and yeah, I think that is, unfortunately it's an unsexy answer, but yeah. It's the reality of the situation. It's the reality. Lawyer up and also identify the red flags. And then what I'll tell you is go talk to Cheval. Go look at a girl you might know foundation because that is huge. These attorneys can cost up to three fifty to a thousand to I've seen it some attorneys have an hourly rate of two thousand. An hour. Yeah. An hour. Yeah. Yeah, you're, yeah. I see that I look. Know. It's like I feel it, I know it. But your non for profit <laughs> is going to help people that can't afford that. Um let's talk about your brand. So you pivot your brand into designing shoes. In the midst of all this, first tell us a little bit about the brand. The brand was really inspired by resilience and running against the wind and just not letting circumstances define you. And while, you know, it can feel feel very limiting to me in my situation, it allowed me to kind of look over here now and say, okay, actually I can reach more women with shoes. I can still be creative. Um, I'm obviously entering an industry that is (laughs) so competitive and so diluted and there are so many experts already there. Yeah. Um, And so the deterrent was really me overcoming my own sense of insecurity and like starting something new. Um, So I did take some time to really educate myself. You know, I tried to reach out to as many people that already were in that industry, like give me your fast facts of like where I should start, what I should do. I had so many people saying, do not go into shoes if you want to make money. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm doing it anyway. You know, like, so um, it's been an exciting journey, but most of all, 
it has allowed me to tap into a skill set that I dedicated my life to, you know, in some kind of way, but it is so different than dress design. I am (laughs) sure it's night and day, but uh, here's the one piece of inspiration I think that is a blanket piece of inspiration. So many people have the idea, they don't start it. They have millions of excuses why they don't start the business. Capital, timing, industry expertise, all the things. You wipe out your wealth. You're spending seven figures on freaking attorneys. You, you can't be in the industry you know best, but you still do it. What's your piece of advice for someone that doesn't have the capital, that doesn't have the expertise? What do you do? How do you start it? What do you do? What's the biggest piece of advice you can give them? Invest in self. Um, when you don't have resources, you just have to be resourceful, right? And it seems easier to say. Obviously, it's easier to say than it is to do, but – Take a minute to really look at your contributions and like, where's your skill? Where are your fine tuned um, talents, Mm -hmm. you know, and how can they transfer? How can they be applied? Um, How much time do you have in the day to spend on it? You know, and really thoughtfully think about time management because there is a lot of time wasted these days. I mean, if you really think about like how long you scroll, you know, or like late nights watching TV, like you could be doing something else during that time, you know, and not to say you have to like be working 24 seven, but I think when you do have um, a goal, you've got to put the effort and you owe it to yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say the one common denominator in every entrepreneur, every small business starter I know is that they are just not lazy. Mm -hmm. You know, and that if you are just not lazy, um, and you work at it every single day, I do think it's the baby steps are not for babies and mm. you'll find you're making the progress, you know, long-term. Shaval's just dropping truth bombs out here. <laughs> One big takeaway I just had too was companies spend billions of dollars to distract us. Don't fall for the trap. Because oh, if you so don't true. fall for the Netflix trap, if you don't fall for those traps that they are built and designed to trap us, you'll have the time to do this. Let's give a quick pitch though. Someone right now is listening. They want to support you. They want to buy shoes uh, with, with your brand. Where do they go? And then give me like minimum price points and why they should buy the shoe. We are available mainly online. So yeah. she is cheval.com. And then we have a pop-up shop in New York City at the Seaport, cool. which is our little jewel box of a shoe par- parlor. Um, and then we're doing pop-ups kind of around the states now, uh, which are slow and steady. But you know, we're trying to find these little nooks that we can uh, you can see the shoes and try them on in person because okay. that's obviously a very important part of the process. And, yeah, I mean, I've learned so much about visual imagery and like website photography, okay. <laughs> and like because it doesn't always translate with a yeah, physical product, sure, especially sure. shoes and Sparkle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you can, you can shop there and we're specialty. I was not afraid to be really specific, uh, because that's always how I've operated as a designer in general, but wait, wait, wait. what is like for someone like me who doesn't know specialty means what specialty is just like, it's novelty. No, it's not custom, but it's like not your average shoe, you know, (laughs) like (laughs) that's rare. I mean, there's like real flowers in one of the heels set in resin, you know, it's like a preserved heel with floral in it. You know, there's like draped rhinestone and pearl and like, you know, it's obviously kind of set up for like big day vibes and things that are, are make you feel special mm-hmm. um, event wise. Like if you're going to a party or something or a Taylor Swift concert, you know, God. all this stuff, like we have the shoe for you. <laughs> I love that. Okay. And then um, I wanted a really wide assortment because I didn't know what I was doing, but I was like, you know, let's just put it all out there and see what people gravitate toward and then we'll find our, our way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got a lot of, I've had a lot of success with the sneakers and the boots as well. So like chunky block heel boots and there's like a cowboy, you know, vinyl boot. Mm -hmm. Um, so now I'm kind of getting the rhythm of, okay, what's the next collection going to look like now that we know a little more about our identity, you know, within the shoe space. Um, and I would just say, you know, in terms of shopping for product, a lot of times it just feels like people are pushing things on you. Mm Um, but for us, like we believe in carrying out our mission, not just stating it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think it comes with a a sense of purpose and pride that, um, a lot of women can relate to and want to step into. And that's why it's, she is Cheval. Like Mm -hmm. she is fierce. She is ongoing. Mm -hmm. She is a work in progress. You know, all these things that kind of help you identify with your own story, um, because what I went through obviously is very <laughs> unique. Uh, <laughs> but I think a lot of people can relate to having a sense of setback, mm-hmm. you know, and, and how do you move forward and take those fresh steps? So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff, um, that's like hidden throughout the branding. Like our signature print actually tells the journey of my creative story and there's like hidden 
nostalgic nuances in it, like a lava lamp and Pac-Man's ghosts and like crazy wow. stuff. But it's like a twall print, so it looks very glamorous. Yeah. But if you look close, you're like, is that a troll doll? Like, yes, it is. I <laughs> so, love that. All right, go yeah. follow that Instagram handle. Go, oh, I could say this, you might make me take it out, but go unfollow the Miss Haley page <laughs> if you want to support this and go check out Haley, all that glitters on the gram. Let me repeat that. Go check out Cheval, all that glitters on the gram. All right. I have one last subject we got to touch on because the listeners had asked me, uh, say yes to the dress. We just got some quick rapid fire questions here. Okay. Say yes to the dress. Does the dress that the individuals select, do they have to pay full retail on it? Do they get a discount? You know, I actually was never privy Interesting. to that. Okay. So I don't know. Okay. I would assume they'd have to pay for the dress, but I don't know. Do you have any idea like what the casting process was to get the people on the show? I, I'm almost positive that like you can submit. To, to just like an application show. to go on the show and they okay. review it and then they decide. Gotcha. I'm okay. pretty sure. Gotcha. Were you compensated better as a head of design or better being on say yes to dress? Oh, I don't know. Oh no. I, I think my employment role more than my employment paid more than say yes yeah, to dress. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah, what yeah. is one thing that we don't know about say yes to the dress watching it on TV that you might know behind the scenes? It could be business, it could be how things are seen, maybe bloopers or mistakes, things that get screwed up. That's what they wanted to know. One thing we wouldn't be able to see through our screen on say yes to the dress. I would say Randy Finoli is as amazing as he seems. Okay, that's a good one. That's like one of the number one questions I get asked. Like, it's also safe, and I appreciate a safe answer yeah. given what you've gone through. <laughs> You're like, what? Say yes to the contract that I signed. <laughs> I know. Oh, I've had to look at that too, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. Unbelievable. All right, Chaval, we got to end with one trading secret. You've given us a lot, but one trading secret regarding your career path, your journey, your ups, downs, lefts, and rights. People couldn't Google. They couldn't learn from a professor. They could only learn from you. What could you leave us with? Going after... Your biggest dreams should not come at the expense of your morals, your ethics, your creativity, or your name. <laughs> I love that. So don't do what I did. <laughs> yeah. So don't do what I did. I also, one of my, the big training secrets I take is like, time is finite and you really got to fight for what you believe in. Because if you don't fight, the system is set up to really not allow you to fight. Mm. But at the end of the day, you we only get so many years. You are only, or you come, we go, there's the next generation, and your story will live much longer than your life, right? Mm, and the thanks. impact it'll have will live longer. And to me, it's like, it's easy. It's supposed to be easy to just be like, all right, we'll settle, let's figure it out. But fighting and really like standing for what you believe in is like a life legacy. So I think you should yeah. be so proud of that. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank I you. I love it. All right, well, let's end yeah. with this. Where can people find Everything, your Instagrams, your new business. You already mentioned you're not for profit. I want the full pitch because you <laughs> deserve the pitch and Aww. we need to go follow Cheval. So give it give it all to us. Okay. So she is Cheval, uh, dot com, and then that's the Instagram handle for shoes. And then I still run all the glitters on the gram. Ironically, it was started as Conrad in my podcast account. Oh my God. Oh, that's right. I, I kind of usurped that. it. Yeah, uh, I remember which, that. which you and Caitlin were on. Yes. I'm going to have to go re-listen to that episode. Yes. Um, I might have to listen to that. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we're on, I had to start a new Pinterest account. So I have that. And I'm, I'm trying with TikTok. I'm not great, but I'm trying. And then, um, yeah, a girl you might know foundation.org. A girl you might know foundation is the handle name. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the whole shebang. That's the whole shebang. Go yeah. follow her. Go support her. And I know I can say this, but if you see Miss Haley Page out there in photos and her name and her dresses, think twice because you guys know the full story. Thank you so much for being on Training Secrets. Oh, thanks for having me. 